There we go. We are uh, recording this for everybody's awareness. Once again, we know we've had trouble getting those other uh, videos put together and out there for you, so we apologize, but we are working on that uh, from our workshop that we had here. Uh, and sooner or later, we'll have those on our website. We just have to do some editing and uh, do some transitioning of those. But it's 10 o'clock, so I'm gonna get rolling promptly at 10. Uh, we're really happy to have you. So far, Stephanie and jo Joan are able to uh, join us here. Wade and Todd Hi. are going to be coming along as well, uh, but Stephanie and Joan are first up. And uh, Todd, Todd's kind of on a big question. Uh, on again, off again kind of thing. They're trying to figure out how to get to Seattle tomorrow for uh, a couple of weeks to visit some relatives uh, and get everything handled. Um, but nonetheless, uh, welcome to everyone. Again, if you can, please type in your name as you come in so that uh, we have something other than just your email address that's uh, being shown to us. I also am going to ask you just so that you can block out uh, background noises that might occur. If you could mute uh, yourself in the lower left-hand corner, you can do that. Please feel free to unmute yourself if a question arises during any of the presentations. Um, and But you also, if questions do come up, you do have a chat button. It might be hidden on your screen, but if you kind of go and hover down towards the bottom, you're going to see uh, where there's a chat button kind of on the right-hand side that you can click on. And when you do that, it's coming to us. That, that, that question will come directly to us, so not everyone sees it, and then we'll be able to uh, respond to it. You also can ask questions that way, or if you want to use Google Docs, you're free to use Google Docs as well, so that uh, we have one question already, and we'll give we'll pass that one along. Wade, I think, seen that and can respond to it once his turn comes around, and uh, we'll take care of everything. What's that? You haven't? I'll, I'll, uh, it's an easy one that we'll pass along, and uh, then uh, uh, everything should work out fine. Um, if if uh, just as a friendly reminder, uh, the next session uh, on Zoom will be August 21st. I really encourage you to join that one. That's a really special one. Tuesday, August 21st, Jan Dolishaw will be presenting on risk management, Title IX information, and sexual harassment. It's really an outstanding presentation. We do plan about two hours for that one. It's the longest one that we uh, do, but uh, it's really well worth it. And if you can just chime in and uh, you'll have direct communication with her. If you want to jot down, we then have plans for September 13th and Thursday, October 11th will be the dates that follow after that. We just want to stay in touch with you and uh, be able to provide you with resources. That's what we're here for and lots of them get a goal. Uh, I'm going to open things up today. Uh, by I mentioned Wade Lebecki is now here and Todd Clark has joined us. So we've got everybody in and around, but Stephanie is going to be first. We're going to hit the chat thing as uh, for any questions that might come up there. And uh, the, uh, the uh, August 21st meeting is again at 10 o'clock. Someone was asking, so we'll respond to that. But other than that, we will mute Bill, and we're going to go to Stephanie. She's got a little uh, presentation that she's going to provide for you. I think you'll find it very well put together. Stephanie, all you. All right, welcome. First topic that I was given was uh, talking about hosting your first big home game. You know, I shared with you the new AD workshop. We talked about hosting a tournament game, and really. This pretty much applies to that as well. The only difference in you know, a tournament game really is that follow-up financial report you would do with our office. So again, this would kind of apply the same to hosting a tournament game. So you're getting ready, you've got your first swim meet, or you've got your first football or volleyball match coming up. Here are some things we're gonna think about. As you prepare for that opportunity, let's kind of run through some things that are important. I'm big on checklists. I would encourage you just to start a checklist right now and um, do that. It, it's so easy to forget things. So, you know, you make your checklist and it might change from one event to the next, but start a checklist. Here are some things you can include on that checklist right off the bat. Don't forget to call your officials, double check you've got contracts for them. 
Uh, verify the mileage, who will be driving, how that's going to be paid. Verify you've got locker room space for them. Make sure you know their departure time and their cell phone contact. That's really important too because you've got um, weather issues and things like that. So make sure you know when they're going to leave so you can get a hold of them to reschedule or cancel or change them. Somebody's got to mute their microphone. I think you can all probably hear that. Please double check and mute your microphone. So you've got a lot of background noise going on there. Also, confirm with your opponent. Opponent, make sure you know how many levels of teams are bringing. There's nothing worse than a surprise when they walk to the door and they're bringing three teams instead of two, and you weren't prepared for that. So, I want to just verify how many levels of teams are bringing, what time they'll be there, or if they have any special needs. Uh, for example, um, sometimes your football team is a female player, and you didn't get prepared for that. So you don't have locker room space for her. So. You're going to want to touch base and find out if they have any special requests for their team. Also, an important question, are they going to have staff available to help out with their field and the stands? That will help you in planning for your, your supervision, your crowd control. Check the weather forecast and review your emergency weather plans, not only for yourself, but also for all of your workers. And this is, this is maybe not necessary in all cases, <clears throat> but especially for your bigger events, it's really important that you have a game itinerary or a timeline or information sheet that you share with everybody who's working, officials, your opponents. We have samples here in our office. If anybody would like a sample of one of those, we're happy to share that with you. Also, when you're preparing, uh, make sure you contact your concession stand people. Think about things such as how big of an event is this going to be? What's the weather forecast going to be? Is it going to be 85 and humid? Make sure you got lots of Gatorade and water. Is it going to be cold? Make sure you're fully stocked on hot chocolate. Time of day it is. That's going to impact your crowd size and weather as well. Uh, notify and be in contact with any performance groups, your band, your comms, your cheer, your cheer squad. Make plans for a national anthem, your halftime schedule. Let your opponent know of anything that's unusual. Sometimes for football games, it's parents' night, you have to extend your halftime. Make sure that your opponents know that. Make sure you've got your event workers all set to go. They know what time they're going to be there, what duties they've got, and how you're going to communicate throughout your event with them. Radio, cell phone, make sure you've got plans set with your event workers. Media coverage, you've got lots of media avenues. You want to be prepared for that. You want to have designated space for them. Let them know if there's special circumstances. Should the radio bring a cell phone to transmit through, or you have a direct plug-in that they can use? They need to bring their own table and chairs. Prepare your team rosters, your game day programs. Have those ready for your spectators and print it up in advance. And make sure you get your facility reserve. This is a biggie. We, none of us like surprises. Also, we find out that there's a double book in your facility. And work closely with your grounds crew and custodial staff to make sure that everything can be set up on time and how you'd like it set up. Last slide to prepare. Make sure you've got cash boxes ready to go. Um, banks aren't open when you're running your events. And so if you've got a $4 admission, you're going to want to make sure you got plenty of singles on hand because there's nowhere to go get change once that game starts. Meet with your coach to go over anything you might have missed, any special needs that your coach wants to have. Publicize your event through your school district webpage, social media. Meet with your school administration to review what duties your administrative staff have. Um, also, your student leaders. This is really important. Student section leaders have a lot of power in your student section. So it's really important you establish common ground with those key kids before that first event so they understand what your expectations are. It's really hard. It's really hard once that event gets going to try to manage behaviors in your, your student section. There's a lot of them and there's one of you. So getting those key student section leaders on your side and kind of on the same page as you before the event starts is a big deal. And then finally, you can't be all places and all events. So some nights you're going to have three events going on at the same time. Determine who that person is going to be. Who's going to be you at a swim meet if you're out at a soccer game? Or who's going to be you in the gym at a volleyball match if you're outside at a cross-country meet? 
Any questions about preparing for your event? Go ahead, if anyone has anything, again, you can unmute at this time and ask a question of Stephanie or any of us. And otherwise you can send a chat or a question on Google Docs. Okay, let's keep going. On game day. Again, have a checklist for game day. Go out and actually physically walk the field or check the gym yourself. It's really important that you do a once over to make sure that everything looks good and it's ready to go. Make sure it's cleaned up. Sometimes you'll be sharing a facility with other, other schools or cities. Locker rooms ready to go. What do teams need? Dry erase, towels, or the bathrooms all prepared. They've got plenty of toilet paper and paper towels. Hang all of your signage so people know how much admission prices is, where they're going to seat, media area. Test your sound system. There's nothing worse than having the national anthem start and she's starting to sing and nobody can hear her. And again, publicize your event, promote it, make sure that people know you've got a big game coming up today. Welcome your game officials, either you or someone you've designated. Same thing for your opponent. Make sure somebody's here to greet them and get them to where they need to be. Monitor throughout the game. The warm-up is a halftime post game. That's going to be an event manager or someone designated to do that. Think about things such as hospitality items, refreshments for your officials, refreshments for your workers or the media. These are not necessary things, but they sure are nice and it makes people want to come back to your venue again when you treat them really well. Again, talk about your game day coverage, your student section. Be visible. As all of us know with teenagers, there's a lot they won't do if they can see that there are adults very close in the vicinity. They'll just, they won't do it. They know you're there and watching. And then, you know, take some notes throughout your event. Sometimes just a quick picture or a note on your phone to yourself to help remind you of some things you want to do a little differently for next time. Don't forget to report your results to media outlets after the game. And then follow up. This one's pretty easy. Do a quick debrief with any staff. It can be right there on site, touching base with people as they walk out the door. It can be a follow-up at school the next day or the next week. Touch base with your student section leaders. Ask them how it went. You know, talk about some behaviors you weren't real happy with or things you thought they did that were awesome. Let them know. They like to hear that from you. Do the same thing with your coach. Ask them what went well, what went well, what needs to change for next time, and then update your checklist as needed, if needed. We'll take questions at this time for any of, from any of you that would like to do some follow-up on hosting that first event. Yes, this presentation, um, one of the questions we were asked was if you can share this with you via email. I can send you the PowerPoint, definitely, but we will also be recording this live. Updike, we got a lot of messages. Updike, we need you to turn, turn your microphone off. We're getting lots of echo from... Okay, how do I do that? <laughs> Lower left-hand corner, Phil. There's a microphone. Oh, okay. I see it. There yeah, go. good job. We got it. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. Again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box or send them to us uh, in adva using advanced questions on Google Docs. We're glad to help out. We're going to keep moving right along. The next area is an important one uh, for you to be looking at, and that is uh, coaches uh, requirements and credentials and uh, eligibility, if you will. And our true expert on this area, Joan Grala, is here to go over a number of different issues with you. Wade's here too, because you may have some questions uh, about this. Uh, we're just going to let Joan go first, and then uh, if some questions come up chat-wise, we'll take those. Joan, go ahead. Thank you. Um, the biggest question I always get is about coaches not licensed to teach. If you have those individuals on your coaching staff, whether they're a head coach, assistant coach, paid, unpaid volunteer, they must meet our requirement of completing the NFHS Fundamentals of Coaching course prior to coaching their second year. 
So this year, if you have any new coaches that are not licensed teachers, they can coach this year, but before they coach again next year, they need to complete that course. For those individuals that are new this year, you need to fill out the CNLT form, Coaches Not Licensed to Teach form. You can find that on our website. Um, fill that out, send it to me. There is a $10 charge to submit that form. Um, you can put as many coaches, you can do all your coaches for every season or you can submit a form prior to each season. Um, the other requirement we have is that all paid coaches need to be AED CPR first aid certified. Now, if you happen to have a, a CNLT that um, needs to take, that is a paid coach, um, that person has to be certified as well. Um, like and then they the would not line. need to take the sport first aid course through the Federation. So if you require all your coach, coaches to be certified in AED, CPR, and first aid, the CNLT, the coach not licensed to teach, would not need to take that sport first aid course through the NFHS. Are there any questions at this point? I mean, it's pretty, pretty general, pretty simple. Did you um, want to remind them all paid coaches have to take first aid CPR? And I did. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. If you have any questions, feel free. We're not seeing anything on the chat line at all. Mark, we did mute you. Just want to make you aware of that. If you need something, just let us know and we'll unmute you then. Uh, so that uh, just for clarity purposes, we did that. But if you have anything, feel free again to use the chat or Google Docs. Great. All right, Wade, you're up next. I don't know if you want to handle the question first or if you, Wade's going to discuss transportation schedules and I'm going to uh, move over to Wade over here. Well, and the, you know, I've, I haven't been in a school for a while, so bear with me. I, I was the transportation director for uh, three years as well as the athletic director at the same time. So one of the things that is very important is that you go ahead and you make sure that your, your schedules for your athletic programs match your transportation schedule. So when you go ahead and you put out this week's notices or this week, you know, your events, make sure that when you have an away event, you're comparing one, the dismissal time, two, the pickup time, and then the return time with your transportation director as well. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have those two items taken care of. And as Stephanie pointed out to me earlier, is make sure that your early dismissal time is provided to all of the staff at your school. So your secretary isn't bombarded, one, by the absences that are automatically put into your attendance schedules, and then the parents aren't bombarded because they get an automatic note that their kid has missed eighth hour or seventh hour, whichever the hour of the day is. So those are little early reminders. Um, your transportation director is going to be a very important person. Um, as Stephanie says, you know, just as your custodian is, uh, you, you, you're going to want to be in contact with your transportation director. Remember, if you add an event, a JV football game or JV volleyball game, make sure that you contact your transportation person as well. So on your checklist, when you're going down and adding an event, you have to make sure your transportation director is on there if it's an away event. Uh, coaches should be communicating with parents. So if you're going to go ahead and have someone be taken home by their uh, parent, that you have communication or the coaches have communicated with those parents that when the parent picks them up, they have the signed permission slip that they check the person out, that the student doesn't just leave without the coaches going ahead and communicating and being eyeball to eyeball with that parent. Um, the other thing that you wanna note is what your policy is on students ride, riding home with other parents. You know, and when I was an AD, we did not allow that. Only parents could take their kids home or grandparents. We did not allow other parents to take home other kids. And that's for liability purposes. So you wanna make sure with that. But I can't emphasize how much you want to compare your schedules every week. Nothing worse than having somebody going ahead and or a team standing there waiting for their bus to show up, and it doesn't show up because the the uh, wasn't on the transportation schedule as well. Uh, also note, in the spring, you're going to have to be creative. When you have spring rainouts and snowouts, you're going to have cancellations. As you have cancellations, 
the buses are going to be, you know, limited. You may have field trips that uh, are going as well. I know when I was transportation director in the spring, every classroom was going on a field trip in May. So when you had a softball or a baseball rainout, it caused some issues. You may have to double up teams and send two teams on the same bus, whether it's softball, baseball to the same city or whatever, you may have to go ahead and get creative with that. But I would urge you to, when you're now, because your first contest start this weekend, whether it's football or I believe tennis has contests this weekend. Yes. Um, yep. So you, you'll want to go ahead and make sure that your transportation is lined up. State law also says that any vans, I believe, that are over uh, minivan size, over six passengers, you have to have a chauffeur's license uh, to drive that. So you'll have to check that. There are also background checks that are required for transportation and people who have those licenses. So just little things like that that you'll have to uh, keep in mind. Uh, as I look at the questions here, there's a transfer questions. Are there any questions on transportation before I go to a transfer question? Permissions that we could share for transportation? I do not, but uh, Stephanie, do you have anything that you could get from Spash? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll, 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 switch. we'll put that on our notes. In fact, do any of you on this call right now have one you'd be willing to share with each other? What was the question? A transportation, they're, what they're looking for is a, a, a permission to transport your child for a parent. Yep. Anybody, someone here is looking for one. Does anyone want to share one with everybody? We do ours online. Do you guys suggest anything? Are you, have you heard of any other schools that do it online? No, we still have the old hard copy. It's Spash. Um, I think when Jan Dullishall meets with you, she's actually going to talk a little bit about liability with this slip. But um, anybody else have a slip that they use online or hard copy? No. Okay. Um, we'll try to see if we can't get a form that Tom can, yep. can uh, email out Absolutely. to the group. Um, the question that I have here from a chat is if a student transfers into your school and, and an EBTS is returned from the prior school without any issues noted, is there anything further needed to be done, like sending up to the WIA? Um, and I can't read with this box in the way. Um, or to keep it on file. What I, I tell everybody, you always send the EBTS form. That tells you if there's any outstanding discipline. It tells you if there's any outstanding academic suspensions. And it also will go ahead and, and tell you how long those uh, issues are or suspensions are to be held. So always send that out. Now, if you have confirmed that it's a total and complete change of residence, that they've, the entire family has, sold their, has moved, everything that's in that house has been moved, that their other house has permanently been sold or the lease is done, and you confirm that, and a transfer is made necessary, you send the EBTS, you don't have to send it here. The EBTS comes here when there's a waiver that's being requested. Also, I always remind people to check the transcripts because if they have a failing grade, it may not be noted on that EBTS, and you're still responsible for, that, for the eligibility of that student. So if it comes out later, they had two Fs and they should have been sitting and they play in a game, you will forfeit. And we've had several of those situations come up in falls here and they come before the board and the board says that's an administrative uh, duty and you are responsible for that. So in addition to that EVTS, always check the transcripts. You've confirmed that it's a total complete change of residence. You keep that in their file. It doesn't come to here. Uh, we only get them when there's a waiver request, but make sure you check those transcripts because people will fill those forms out without going in depth because that's not their student anymore. And if they're in a hurry, they may, may forget that that student had failing grades or they may not realize they've had failing grades. Great response. Great response. So the other question is we have a prearranged form that can uh, be filled out ahead of time if they were leaving with someone Trent. other than their guardian. So Trent has that form. Trent, may, perhaps you might be able to email that to everybody, uh, just using, uh, you're going to be able to access that whole list that, uh, because everybody's on there that, uh, from the Zoom meeting invite that I sent. And uh, if you can do something like that, that'd be awesome, and we'd really appreciate it. Forms like that are really valuable. Great job. If you've got other questions for Wade, you feel free to send them to us. 
Uh, we also, we do have time for additional questions at the end. So if someone wants to ask some additional questions, then you're going to have a chance there as well. But at this time, what I'd like to do is introduce you to, because uh, Todd Clark, our communications director, who does a great job with all of our communications, and I'm going to go the other way, sorry about that, I'm getting used to how this bugger focuses around. There's Smiling Todd. There you go. Todd was not able to join us for the workshop, so you get to meet Todd for the first time, and you're going to talk with him a lot about various communication issues that you have. But uh, the area meetings are coming up, uh, and uh, Todd is great with being able to provide us with some insight because he gets to, he's been going to them all for quite a while. So uh, he can tell you why you want to be at these and uh, the kinds of things that are going to take place at them. Pat, go ahead. Thanks, Tom. The area of meetings is one of the opportunities that the membership gets a chance to get together and share ideas. And uh, at the beginning of the year, um, I guess I would uh, just say there are three opportunities, I think, that are really important for athletic directors and the staff to, to be able to get together and uh, communicate and talk about the issues facing interscholastic athletics in Wisconsin. And one of those opportunities are the fall area meetings uh, based on your board of control uh, district that you are in. We're starting Monday, September 10th with the first area meeting that's at Fox Valley Lutheran High School. And then we, we conclude with the District 5 uh, over in uh, Mount Horeb. Uh, so in between uh, those two or three weeks, uh, we have seven area meetings and, and find an area meeting nearest you. And uh, if, if in fact um, you can't get the one in your district, uh, no problem going to a, a adjoining district and going to one of those area meetings. But we do encourage you to go to at least one. And uh, the other two uh, opportunities, uh, definitely I think the WADA uh, meetings and convention in November are very important times to for uh, uh, staff and ladies get together and share ideas as well as of course our annual uh, meeting in April which is the, the business meeting so I encourage you uh, to schedule those three events uh, important that uh, you know the, the line of communication remains open uh, with staff and athletic directors around the state as far as the 2018 area meetings we as a staff met uh, the other day trying to identify topics and that's still ongoing as to uh, all the, the discussion topics that we'll have. But, but typically, and we'll continue this year, we discuss, uh, first of all, uh, the, the change, uh, constitutional changes that took place and were voted on in April. Uh, we'll go and review those uh, as they are implemented for 2018 and 19, uh, as well as some possible constitutional changes that you'll be seeing in next April uh, and discuss uh, those at length as well. The three topics, I think, as we went around as a staff that we're looking at, uh, maybe more uh, in-depth discussion, First of all, on July 23rd, the Wisconsin Football Coaches Association released uh, their uh, proposal uh, for football-only conference alignment. And I think, uh, not speaking for Wade, but uh, there's a lot of interest in discussing that. Uh, we look forward to getting the reactions uh, to the, from the membership, the board will see it for the first time and discuss it where well, they've seen it, but for the first time they'll be together to discuss it uh, tomorrow at their board meeting. So uh, we'll report out uh, the discussions of the board meeting uh, to you uh, at the area meeting. The other one that uh, we wanted to uh, discuss a little bit from the staff meeting that we had uh, and get feedback from the membership uh, is uh, something uh, Director uh, Dave Anderson brought up at the annual meeting looking forward to a possible constitutional amendment uh, for next uh, April is uh, a change and an edit to the code of conduct and what we would do with uh, some, of the, some of the criminal charges stemming from an assault of a weapon or causing bodily harm, seeing if uh, the penalty would uh, include uh, missing the entire tournament series. So that's something that we're going to want your uh, ideas and, and feedback on, and that is going to be on the agenda as well. And the other one, uh, yesterday, a task force to uh, look at conference realignment and the process that we have and to see if there's any uh, ways to improve that. I know Stephanie and Wade both 
were in on that meeting and if they care to chime in, uh, that is another uh, discussion that I believe we will have uh, to report out what that task force uh, mission is and, and what it, it plans to do moving forward. So that's sort of a review uh, and encouragement for you to, to come to one of the area meetings in your area. Tom. Thank you, Chad. Really well done. Uh, any questions for Todd at all? Anybody has anything? They will be, those area meetings will be starting, what's the first September one? 10th. September uh, 10th, I believe that is. Yep. Okay. That's it. With everything. So be aware of those coming in. I mean, I, I can certainly all right. share those with you. If you just to, and just a real quick, yeah, um, why don't you? so you know what an area meeting is if you've never been to one? There's seven, there's seven across the state. And so what you're going to do is you're going to look on the WA calendar, find the one that's closest to you, or maybe that, you know, a lot of the conference schools are going to go to. And that's the one that you'll probably most likely attend. Those happen over the first three weeks of September, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so starting the, on which day? Wednesday. So the first one is at Fox Valley Lutheran on September 10th. The second one is at Greenfield High School on September 11th. Third one is at Mauston on September 12th. The following week, then it's Oconomowoc on the 17th, Rice Lake on the 18th, and Anigo on the 19th. And then the last one is at Mount Horb on September 24th. So you can find those on page eight of your senior high handbook. They're on the calendar and they're also online underneath the belt, if I'm correct. Right. And if you don't know what district you're in, what board of control district you're in, that's also in the senior high handbook. Uh, I believe. And that's on that's page, page 16. 16. So it'll describe or it gives a, a printout and a map of what district each school in our membership are in if you want to uh, attend uh, your uh, district's area meeting. And generally, they will go about uh, two and a half hours. We'll usually start, uh, I believe there's uh, coffee and donuts at about 8.30. 9 o'clock we'll start, and usually we're out of there by 11.30 or 12. It all really depends on how much interaction there is with the people who are there. But I would plan on being done by noon. Thank you, everyone. Todd, especially, appreciate that. Well done. If there are other questions, feel free to send them our way. Otherwise, we're going to send it back to Stephanie. And Stephanie in, is going to have a... Little PowerPoint presentation for you on some of the conference meetings. Okay, so you're going to get asked, you're going to be required to attend some conference meetings coming up uh, in the near future. And what we wanted to do was just give you some idea of why these conference meetings occur, what your role is, and uh, some of the things that you can expect. And Stephanie's put together a whole PowerPoint for you on that. Go ahead. Yeah, this one's a pretty short one. But we'll just, we'll just run through these fairly quickly. Um, you may be familiar with some of these, as many of you have probably been a head coach of some sports. So let's just kind of shift to how it changes with your new role as athletic director. You're probably aware that you have a conference constitution with bylaws. So you're going to want to have a copy of that for reference. There's a lot of times we get calls here in our office, such as, um, Hey, I've got a, a kid that wants to play both soccer and football this fall. Does the WIA allow that? And the WIA, that's an example of a rule. The WIA does allow that, but, but oftentimes conferences don't. So you're going to want to check with your conference bylaws on, on some specifics like that to see what your conference allows. You're going to see a whole section of bylaws versus sports-specific details, so kind of overall guidelines for your conference, and then it will break it down by sport with all the details for each sport that your conference offer, offers. So within those, um, within that conference by law and constitution, you'll see procedures for all conference selection, awards, a number of awards that are given for each, how to host a conference tournament. There's gonna be agreed upon officials payment and mileage reimbursement policies for your conference. Also, there'll be conference admission prices that you know you need to abide by. Most conferences will have some type of a conference pass that allows complimentary admission for maybe coaches or senior citizens or students. So you definitely want to check with your conference on that. And then and then usually you'll have a general place, someone designated to keep statistics, whether that's an individual person per sport or whether your conference pays for one to do statistics overall for your conference. 
conferences are led by, by not only your principal superintendents and a designated you know, um, uh, president, treasurer, but you will have a conference commissioner. That's usually not someone that's part of your conference directly. It's usually someone outside of it or a retired AD or retired principal. This person will handle a lot of the scheduling and the details behind the scenes for your conference, such as scheduling your conference meetings. They will create your varsity schedules, maybe even will create your JV and freshman schedules as well. They'll hire pretty much all of your varsity game officials for conference events. You shouldn't be responsible for that, but definitely you're gonna to wanna to check on that. You probably are responsible for hiring your non-conference varsity game officials. But again, some conference commissioners are willing to do that for you as well. They will organize and lead your conference meetings. They will take care of probably ordering all of your conference trophies and awards, and they will probably be the one that leads those all conference meetings. Here's what you can expect at your, at your first conference AD meeting. Some of you maybe already had your first one, but you're probably going to look at and review your upcoming sports schedules just to make sure that there's no glitches. Everybody knows how many teams everybody's got. You know, maybe somebody had to drop a freshman schedule because of low numbers. You'll share that at that meeting. You'll also discuss upcoming seasons. You're probably already looking at your winter, maybe not your spring yet, but probably your winter season. And then you're going to talk about those proposals that come from your coaches meetings. If you've been a head coach, you know that if there's certain things you want to change, for example, if you want to add a, a third team all conference for football, this would come through your coaches and then to your athletic directors. Your ADs take action and then it will go on to your principals and maybe even superintendents to ultimately decide if those changes we made. We would hope that you are also discussing issues brought forth by your WADA organization and also WIAA at your conference level. And then finally, your role as an athletic director, specifically you're representing your school on behalf of all your coaches. You are kind of that person that comes to the table to represent your school and speak on their behalf. You're gonna host conference tournaments when those are assigned to you or when your school comes up in the rotation. And then we hope that you are an active member in not only your conference, but also those local caucus discussions and state discussions through WADA. Uh, we would love for you to get active in maybe your sports advisory or those WADA positions and be active at your WADA workshop. Look for more information on that WADA workshop coming up in November. It is a great opportunity for you to get to know new people and get some great new ideas. That's the end of my presentation. What, what, what questions do you have for me? There, hi. Good to see you guys. Exactly. We could probably unmute everybody too, Steph, if you want to just go to that. And because we're done with our presentation. Everybody is all finished with everything. And we can kind of open things up. Uh, first of all, folks, I would, is there something, Tad, that you wanted to add? Go? Wait. I just want to put out a couple of reminders now because this is when you're starting your competitions now. So you're going to have competitions starting probably on Thursday for some of you with JV football games. You're going to have football games on Friday and Saturday, varsity. You're also going to be starting your, your tennis and, and you're going to be starting your, your golf competitions. Check the eligibility of your athletes. So make sure that you have a complete list of everybody on those teams and an updated list. And if the list has changed since you last checked their grades, make sure you check the grades of everyone who has now come out. So if you had someone come out for football a week late, make sure that check, you check their grades. You may have checked the grades of everybody who showed up the first day, but make sure that you have checked the grades for everybody who has showed up the second day or the following days. Also, if you have transfer students, Make sure that you check with your coaches and ask them if they see any new faces. Make sure that you check their eligibility as far as total and complete change of residence and sending that EPS form and the transcript form. So those are just a couple of quick reminders that you can do that uh, when you visit the coaches out for their practices or, or before the first game so you don't get caught off guard. A reminder, coaches are also responsible for all of that. So don't just put all of that on yourself. If you have, if you have uh, coaches, they should be familiar with their season regulations and their tournament procedures. So they should be helping you out with that. 
And as you go through the fall, we've already had two schools who have dropped their eight-player football because they didn't have enough numbers. A reminder, fall sports, if you drop a sport, you have to sign up again by the deadline, which is February 1st. If you are going to start a new co-op, the deadline for that for fall sports is February 1st. And if you drop a co-op, every team in that co-op, every school in that co-op, if they're going to have a sport next year in the fall, so let's say you have a cross-country co-op, school A and B decide not to co-op next year, both A and B have to sign up by the deadline, February 1st, to determine eligibility for next year. So just a few reminders as you're going through your fall, don't forget that you know there are some deadlines as you approach in February. Great points. Anyone else have anything? I have unmuted everyone, so you are free to ask any questions that you have. Our part of the presentation is concluded, so we welcome any questions, and you're welcome to stay. And if you have a question for one of us, uh, run it past us. We'll be glad to stay here uh, and answer anything that you need at this point in time. So thank you all very, very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And Mark, you've got a question. Yeah, I was wondering, does anybody have an event manager checklist for game day operations out there? Um, we're trying to create one, but if we don't have to invent the wheel, that would be great. I'm pretty sure, yeah. I, I, I'm sure that I have one that I can pass along. Okay, if anyone else has you were thinking what else would yeah, the PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm going to send you that PowerPoint, Mark, and maybe okay. you can get your checklist off of that. If any of you took the um, 502 class, I think that they do have, I think they do have some checklists in that in that manual. Also, those of you that took that class. Stephanie, can you send me the check or the PowerPoint too? I'm gonna. I just. I saw that. Um, I saw that we just got an email from Trent with that transportation form. I'll reply all with that, and I'll I'll send you guys those powerpoints. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Justin, if, uh, you had a question about the WIA. You need to turn your volume up. We are not muted, and everything is working. No. Just want you to be aware of that. All right. Go ahead. Any other questions? Feel free. Could you go over the uh, uh, severe weather policy? We've got a week one home game for football this year. Sure. And what, what is the clarification for severe weather? Well, if, if, when you're looking at the uh, weather, if you go on the WIA website, WIAWI.org, you go under health, you'll find the lightning guidelines. And they've been updated a little bit. So when you when you look at them, the first, I think it's the second point, we'll go ahead and have what is added. And then what that is, is that you need to go ahead and identify the safe area and then determine how long or how much time is needed to get to there. So if you go on online, health, weather, the, the lightning guidelines are there. They're also in the back of every rule book, so it's post as those. But keep in mind, most schools only get one set of rule books and it usually goes to the varsity coach. So I would recommend that you take these guidelines, copy and paste them into a Word doc, laminate them and give them to every coach at every level so they un understand what's happening. And Wade, Wade that's, a, uh, that's the official's call ultimately at a contest, correct? Once the game begins, yes. But you as a tournament manager should be involved. I would make sure that any decision on that is a group decision. A lot of times your trainers will be using an app. They have the app in there. Uh, it can be used as a tool, but it is not the, the sole reason or the sole uh, use for determining whether you continue or not. But correct, Phil, the officials are the final decision makers when it comes during the game from the first uh, kickoff or serve to the last uh, minute fix off the clock. Basically what it says is if you hear thunder or see lightning, you have to stop the event, whether it's practice or a contest, for 30 minutes. And if there's subsequent lightning or thunder, you restart that 30 minute clock and you go from there. Once you have gone ahead and, and gone through there and that 30 minutes has expired, then you can continue the game or the contest from that point. 
they want you to review that policy annually, I would tell you that you should just make sure that your coaches get a copy. Um, they want you to review it annually to make sure if you need to update your safe place. You know, a lot of times if you're out in the middle of a soccer field, there is not anywhere a building to go to, then you might need to go to the school bus. But you need to have the coaches be aware of where it is. The final step that they changed and added is you should inform your athletes and your parents. Now, that's not a WIAA requirement. That's a recommendation from the National Federation. So I would tell you that, you know, consider that as you're going through your season routine, you might cover the, the lightning and thunder. I would tell you that, you know, if the officials don't see it, you can go ahead and go down on the time uh, on the field during the timeout or to break in the action. You might tell them, I've, I've saw lightning in, off in the distance. Uh, it would be best to go ahead and, and stop the game for a little bit. Um, it's very important that you do that. Now, sometimes during this time of the year, you're going to have heat lightning. I think we all know where that is. It's not ground to or sky to ground lightning. But they did cover that, and then what they say is at night, under certain at atmospheric conditions, lightning flashes may be seen in distant storms. In these cases, it may be safe to continue an event. If no thunder can be heard and the flashes are low on the horizon, the storm may not pose a threat. Independently verified lightning detection information would help eliminate that uncertainty. And what they're talking about is to go ahead and, and if you have lightning off in the far distance and it appears to be heat lightning, you don't have thunder, your app would be a good tool to use to make to determine whether or not you need to stop that contest. I would tell you, don't take chances with lightning. You never know. School board, or our board of control president was up at his cabin and a tree got hit this last weekend with that storm that went through. I'm sure Phil probably saw that storm go through Rhinelander. My parents had 15 trees go down in that storm. But their flagpole got bolted right out of the ground. The top ball on there split in half, and they wiped out the the, uh, the uh, cable service for, out to the street. So, don't take chances on that. Just tell your coaches that they don't need to continue with you know those lightning rods at uh, 120 yards apart from each other while they're out on that football field. Uh, I don't you know lightning is a scary thing and it can hit at any time, so they shouldn't be cavalier with it. Great, good question to ask. Thanks for bringing that up. Others, bring them forward. If you've got a concern or an issue that you are having a difficult time with, we're glad to help out. You know, and, and as we we're beginning, you know, and I'm not sure who asked that question. Also under health is emergency action plans. And you should review those, review those. Uh, there is a, it is online underneath uh, health emergency action plans. Every school somewhere in your athletic office should have a uh, binder that's called Anyone Can Save a Life. And we sent those out two years ago. And they're emergency action plans for every sport. And your coaches, it's very easy to fill out. Basically, you assign three teams um, for that situation, a 911 team. Students go ahead and call 911. They also go meet the ambulance, a, a, a CPR AED team. They start CPR immediately, and then you have the AED team, which goes out and gets the AED, brings it back, and then the, the AED team puts it on the person and starts it up. I always tell people you want to get the emergency action plan because more than likely it's for you and not a kid. So they want to make sure that they're, they're ready so they can have a plan both for practice areas and for your competition areas, especially if you're off-site. So you want to check that. For outdoor sports such as football and soccer, you have a fourth team, which is a heat team. You fill a tub with water, and the, you would have a team that would go get ice and fill it. If a kid's having a seizure, you'd dump them in that tub with their head above water, of course. But they'll cool the body temperature down immediately, and you can save a life that way as well. Great point. Tom, just switching gears a little bit with the start of the football season, next, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, just a, a reminder that uh, all football scores need to be reported into the uh, school or the score center database. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, reporting those scores, we do have on our website a uh, place to, to report those scores. Hopefully uh, we need to get those uh, within a half hour after the game. 
Go ahead. We just we also had a question come in. Uh, where can you get the anyone can save a life packet? Wade's going to try to provide you with that information. Right. If you go to the WIA website and you go to the um, health area and underneath health, yep. you go to any the emergency action plan. Share screen. Go to. Okay, I'm trying to figure this out here. here we go. It's coming. We're a little bit slow. You want me to do it, Wade? While you're yep. talking. You go to the um, health page, health menu. On the health menu, you'll go to emergency action plan. From the emergency action plan, you'll go down to the, on the right side. On the right side, it has a link in the third box called sample plans. Underneath, yeah, the, underneath the sample plans, you'll see anyone can save a life. It's a program that Minnesota put together. And that has all of the documentation in it on that website. On that website, they have the three steps where the responsibilities are. And you'll find a video and you'll find all of the documentation there. So it's, it's, a, it's a really neat program. Um, we we have one or two binders is all we have, so if we you know if we don't have enough to distribute to all the schools if we can't find them. But all of the information is right on the website, so it's right at the WI website. And as Stephanie's bringing it up, you go to health on the right, and from the health menu, you'll pull down the emergency action plan here. Can you guys see Wade's screen now? No. Can no. You see, can you see the WIA website? No. No. Okay. Sure. Hang on. All right, hang, hang on, we're almost there. Desktop. Okay, are we back to? Desktop. Yeah. Now can you see it? Can you see it? Yeah. They see it? Yep. I think so. So you go to health, you go to emergency action plan. You got emergency, so we got emergency yeah. action plan. I still don't see it. You guys see the website? I don't see it. Hang tight. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> Hang on. Now, now you got it. it. There you go. Oh, okay. Okay. So we went into health, and then under health, you'll see the steps. The three teams are basically are right, right here. And then on the right side, in the third box down, it says sample plans. Here you can click on anyone can save a life and that will take you to that website. Like I said, it was put together by Minnesota and they have the three easy steps for implementing. So they have the various steps here. Here's your AD responsibilities, in-person training, how to train your staff. It's all right there for you. So they have the, the, the various steps on how to train people. They do have the videos over here on the right. They have the worksheet, and this is the sheet that I was talking about. You print these off, you give them to each coach. They assign the kids to the various steps, and it tells them what their steps are here in the middle. And then you have them practice, and that's the important piece, is you have to practice it at some point or another. But here's your, your assignments, and you have the kids to just assign them to it. And you have three kids in case somebody's not there for practice, or in case they're not, you know, they're on the field and they're in the game. They can't do it. You have other kids who are, are have practiced their steps. So it's all right there online. It's, it's a neat program. I would recommend that, you know, if you don't have it, you, you print off these sheets. Have your coach fill it out. Ask them what day they practiced it. And then have them give you a copy of their sheets as well. You do it for each level of your sport. And it's a good, it's a good program. Because like I said, um, we've had – Adults who have needed that done to them. Uh, last year, to my knowledge, we had um, two referees that were saved by CPR and an AED at high school events. The previous year, we had two or one student from Wanakee saved and two officials. Uh, one was a basketball official, and I believe the other one was a soccer official last spring. So anyone can save a life is a great program, and it does save people. Because we've, we've got actual people that have been saved lately. You have to get to them within three minutes in order to go ahead and save them. So very important. 
absolutely is. All right. Mm -hmm. Questions that folks have. Send them our way. Tom, I've got one. Go ahead. Uh, just to clarify, the co not, coach is not licensed to teach. That includes volunteer coaches that would just come for one or two practices a week kind of thing as well? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. I've got one more question for you. Um, maybe though, before I do, I see the Lakeland AD there. Uh, I might have room for a middle school football game, so maybe you and I can communicate. <laughs> there you go. All right. That um, at its finest here. Yeah. Uh, my question is, I've got a, a student athlete who violated our athletic handbook and uh, plays two uh, sports at the same time. She's a volleyball player and a cheerleader. Is it, you know... The WIA best? rules only apply to WIA sports and cheerleading is not a sport. So okay. make sure that you apply it to the WIA sport. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I was looking at, you know, when we hand about, you know, the discipline action, would it be for both of those activities or not? So uh, apparently just the WIA sport is what I'm understanding as far as your perspective. That's a must. If, it, if it's a WIA sport, they must sit out and serve their penalty. Now, remember, WIA minimum is one. Yeah. So they must sit at least one for WIA if you're going to combine them. That's WIA minimum. Okay. So they and must then serve your code as it's written. Any activity outside of WIA would just be our local jurisdiction then as far as a district and a school? Yes. And if, if, you know, if, if you feel like this is something that may be occurring more frequently than just this one time, it might be language you want to add to your code as to how to address that you've got an athlete that's in two different things. Because sometimes it is two WIA sports, like I mentioned, soccer and football. Right. So... You may want to add language if that's a common occurrence for you to have an athlete that's in two sports at the same time. How do you handle that if it, if it was soccer and football? Would it be both then that they'd have to sit a game? or? Well, you know, it all depends on what your, what your rule is. Remember, WIA rule is one contest, so it would be the first contest. Okay. If, you have, if it's 20% of your season, then you're going to have to calculate how many games you have because football is different with nine. The right. kind of nine is going to be two. And 20% of 26 is going to be five, right? Right. So you're going to, they're going to sit out a minimum of five contests. So if you have two football games in two weeks and three soccer games, then it's five contests and they've set out their five contests. So okay. it would be a matter of how you calculate it. But you want to make sure that they've served a minimum of one for WIA and then you apply your code. As okay. Thank you. Anyone else? And once again, if you have a question like that, feel free to call here. I mean, we're available, and I am available by email most of the time, even though I don't like it, but I will answer emails uh, in order to take care of you, you know, ADs all the time. We will answer your emails. I think that's the important thing for you to know is give us a call, answer individual questions that come up. Uh, as far as we're concerned, you can begin to sign off. And if someone sits on and has another question, we'll be glad to respond to that. But we thank you all very much for taking time this morning. Give us a call. Stay with us. August 20th. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Tom, I just want to say thanks to the staff up there because I've called a couple times and it's really nice how quick and easy it is to work with them. So I hope to continue that. Glad to help. Great job. Good luck in the first weeks. Hey, excellent job, everybody. Yep. And stop recording.